Thanks for the invitation. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so in my lecture, I would like to give you an introduction to the field of tensor networks, which is something which has emerged in the last 10, 15 years, out of also the field of quantum information, where people try to look at qu complex quantum systems from a point of view of quantum information, from a point of view of their entanglement, and trying to understand what entanglement theory can teach us about the structure of these systems and how we can use it to understand these systems better. So I will try to proceed slowly and also give a bit of a background and motivation. Um, this is a school, so please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions and ask your questions, and I will, well, try to, to address them as far as time permits. Um, all right. Okay, so um, as an introduction, Well, what, what are we interested in here? So this is motivated from starting systems in, well, condensed matter physics, high energy physics, maybe also quantum chemistry and so on. And in all these fields, what we have is, well, matter around us is built of many particles, lots of particles indeed. So we have many particle systems. And these particles, well, they're quantum. And generally, between these particles, are interactions, right? So we won't be able, in a general setting, to describe this by simply studying the quantum mechanics of a single particle. We will have to take into account all these particles together, the way they interact, their joint quantum state. So it maybe becomes already clear that if we really want to address this full problem, the quantum correlations between the particles are essential. The entanglement between these particles will be essential. Um, so, of course, if we would consider a problem like that, where we don't have any extra information, this is really a daunting task, right? We, if we have many particles, the number of degrees of freedom grows exponentially with a number of particles. I will say a bit more on that later. Um, so, so it, it, it seems there's no structure at all in that, but of course that's not true. In real matter, there is structure, right? Particles which are close by will interact strongly. Particles which are distant from each other will interact very weakly. So there is some notion of locality, some notion of spatial structure. And it's really this interplay which kind of ultimately allows us to say something about these, how, how these kind of systems behave, which ultimately also allows us to say that the fact that there is some structure in these systems, well, limits the type of entanglement they display. It makes their entanglement still very special, despite being some complex quantum entanglement. And this allows us, from a point of view of entanglement, to address these systems, to study these systems. Now, to be honest, for most of the matter around us, actually, we don't really have to think so much about the quantum interactions. So the entanglement is actually not that important. So most of matter is actually described by what is called mean field theory. And mean field theory basically tells you that, that you kind of neglect entanglement. You only think of entanglement as something which is a corrective level on top of something which is not, not entangled or not entangled in a non-trivial way. So basically, it's saying we, we look at an unentangled set of particles, try to understand the physics there, and starting from that point, we start to correct it. That's not what we're interested in this talk. That's kind of old-style condensed matter physics, if you wish. As I said, it's vastly successful. It describes most of the systems we have around us. And maybe one reason is also that many of the systems around us are at high temperatures compared to the, well, interaction strengths and so on. And at high temperatures, states become quite mixed. And in that case, entanglement becomes less and less important the more mixed the state is. So that's not what we're interested in. So in my lecture, I will try to look at things which are usually termed quantum matter, or sometimes termed quantum matter. So these are systems where the quantum correlations play an essential role, which we can't understand by neglecting entanglement, by neglecting quantum correlations, and which are kind of opposed to what one might call conventional matter. So, as I already said, the regime we're most interested in is a regime of low temperature. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason is, is essentially that, as I said, the, the higher we heat our system, the more mixed the, the state of the system gets, right? And the more mixed the state is, the less entangled it will be. So if you have a state at infinite temperature, a maximally mixed state, the state has no entanglement whatsoever, just everything is completely random and decorrelated. So we kind of would expect, naturally, that the lower we, we choose our temperature, the more quantum the system will behave. So if you want to see the most interesting physics, we should look at very low temperatures, or maybe ideally the ground state. Right, so low temperature. So the ground state should be some most quantum. I'll, I'll make this more specific later on. What, I, my, what, what did I write here? That's important. OK, so now if you want to study these systems consisting of many quantum particles, um, the general framework, well, it, it, it could encompass many different types of systems, system in condensed matter, in quantum chemistry, in high energy physics. In general, we would assume we have a continuous space. We have electrons and nuclei interacting there. Could be extremely complex. In my talk, I will try to address or to mainly focus on a simpler kind of system, which is also closer to quantum information theory, but which still displays many of the features we are interested in especially those which make the quantum matter special. And these are quantum spin systems. On a lattice. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that we are given some spin, and I will denote the spin by a dot. And when I say spin, I really just mean that it's a system with a finite number of levels. I'm not really thinking about the fact that the spin might transform in a specific way under rotations. So it's, it's really more saying that this is a system which can take a certain number of levels, but it doesn't have anything like a fermionic statistics or anything like that. So the simplest case would be C2, which I could think of as a spin one half, but it's really just a two level system. So we have this quantum spin, and then we make some lattice out of that. So we could say have a one dimensional chain of these quantum spin systems. And each of these guys is described by Hilbert space CD. So the total chain is described by taking this CD and tensoring it at n times. So we have a chain of length n. So if one of these if one of our systems is described by a basis i, one, say, uh, let's do zero to d minus one. And the total system has a basis given by i1, i2, and so on where each of these i's, again, can take values from 0 to d minus 1. So what you can already see here is that if I look at the number, total number of possibilities of states my system can take, then each of these can take d possible values. This can take d values. This can take d values, and so on. So the total dimension of this space is d to the n. So this indeed tells us that it's exponentially difficult to describe the system with an exponential number of parameters to describe a general superposition, because we need a coefficient for each of these basis states. So a general state. would be of the form psi is equal to sum over 
C I1, I2 to I n, I1 to I n. And that's a general coefficient describing the state, and this is really a two to the n dimensional vector. So in order to describe a general state in such a system, we would need to describe it to, to specify an exponential number of parameters. And this already tells us why it's, it's hard to describe how such a state behaves. Because if, if there should be a macroscopic system, n will be a large number, right? If, if, if for some way, I mean, you know, we have like something on the order of 10 to the 23 particles per kind of decent sized volume. Even if that's one dimensional, that's still 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 if we have a long chain. That's a huge number, right? Especially given that everything grows exponentially in this number. So if we want to describe anything which we would call a long chain, this number would be prohibitively big, so we have no way of really addressing the full state. And that's kind of the problem we are facing, right? That we're having this exponentially big Hilbert space. Okay, I'll get back to this exponentially big Hilbert space a bit later on, but let me first talk a bit more about the kind of systems we consider. So that's one kind of system, this 1D chains. We could also consider two-dimensional lattices, for instance. These are also particularly interesting. So again, each of these systems would be a d-dimensional space. And I should still kind of specify what I mean by saying the system is on a d-dimensional lattice. What does that actually mean? Or why is this lattice relevant? And this lattice is relevant because, of course, I'm, well, what's the point of just saying I have a number of spins? Well, something must govern the physics of these spins, right? So there will be some interactions in this system, and that's a relevant thing. So I will have, say, some two-body interactions between these guys, some Hamiltonian Hij, which could be, for instance, a two-body interaction. And this could act between adjacent spins, but also between more, more distant spins. But the important thing is that I would like to have some locality structure in the interactions. Which basically means that, well, it could mean different things, but essentially it should mean that Hij decays with a distance. So for instance, the most radical case would be that interactions only act between nearest neighbors, right? Nearest. And it's really the structure of these interactions which sets the lattice structure, which sets the dimensionality of my system, that it really comes from the structure of the interactions in the end. Okay, so maybe I should stress, I mean, you might say that looking at quantum spin systems is something very contrived because we know that the world around us is first of all continuous and second, it consists of fermions. Um, so in that sense, you might indeed argue that it's a very special kind of system, but it also turns out that these systems can emerge very, natural, very naturally as effective theories at certain energy scales or in certain regimes. Say, if you only look at the magnetic properties of a material, because in, in many, well, I mean, condensed matter systems do form lattices, so it's natural to get lattices once you look at condensed matter systems at low temperature. And in these lattices, often electrons will form isolated magnetic degrees of freedom. So you can, for instance, have very tightly bound electrons, which sit in some kind of very localized shell, like D-wave electrons or so. And they will provide a magnetic moment, which is really sitting at that lattice site. And then, we, which then via some mechanism, some indirect mechanism usually will interact with close by magnetic moments. And you can also very naturally get, say, two-dimensional structures or one-dimensional structures if you have some layered material where you have, say, magnetically interacting layers decoupled by some non-magnetic layers. So these things can actually show up 
and also in different type of dimensions, even without engineering them specifically, but of course one can also engineer them. One could take, for instance, optical lattices and in the optical lattice trap atoms and then have a certain number of levels of these atoms provide this D-level system and have them interact. Oh, we can consider many body interactions. I should have stressed this better. I, I just started to draw this, and then I thought after I draw it, I should call it two body. But it could also be many body. Well, let's call them few body. I don't like many body maybe so much. Well, by few, I basically just mean that the, the, the bodiness should not depend on the size of the system, right? You don't, you don't want interactions between all constituents. Now, on the other hand, in physics, uh, um, interactions are always two-body, right? I mean, anything which we get as many bodies against some effective theory. Now, spin systems are also effective theory, so it's fine to have interactions between several constituents, but it will basically only go to the order of perturbation theory in which you get this effective theory. I mean, to get an interaction between really many particles, that's something where you have to go to a very high order in perturbation theories. So that's a very weak effect, typically. Oh, sorry, the, uh, well, indeed, a, a typical case is that D is equal to two, that's why I tend to write two, but uh, yeah, that's correct, thanks. Okay, so, um, so before getting into the entanglement structure of uh, many body systems, let me maybe explain a bit what makes, like, like what kind of phenomena one can find in these kind of systems, which makes them special, which makes them interesting which we don't find in conventional matter. Okay, that was sub, sub point one, quantum many body systems. Okay, point two would be to say something about quantum matter. Quantum matter is things which don't behave like conventional matter. So what, what I should really first say is how conventional matter behaves. Um, so as an example, let me consider a one-dimensional spin chain with a two-level system, so a spin one-half, if you wish. And as a Hamiltonian, I will take the Ising ferromagnet. So I have an Ising ferromagnet, right? So I have spins which interact via an Ising interaction, which makes that they would like to point in parallel in the Z direction, so either both up or both down adjacent spins. And I have a magnetic field, H, which I would like them to align along the x-axis. And now I can ask, well, and, and we look at the low temperature physics, so let's look at the ground state physics. And now we, we can identify two different regimes. We can identify one regime where age is very small. So say zero, right, to go to the kind of simplest point. In that case, well, there will only be the Ising interaction. So the, the spins will like to align in parallel. So what I could have is I could have a state where all spins point up, or I could have a state where all spins point down. Both are valid states. If I go to the limit where the field is very large, then this term is dominating and it forces all spins to align in the plus x direction. So all spins align like that. So now these two cases are very different, right? In one case, there's a unique ground state. In the other case, there are two different ground states, right? So this one is unique. Let me rearrange this so I can put things on top of each other. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to put the, the two cases next to each other. So in the case where age is much larger than one, we have a unique ground state. Here in this case, we have two possible ground states, but of course, 
in principle, any superposition of them will also be a ground state, at least if age is e exactly equal to zero. But approximately, again, this will be an almost degenerate space, so I will have some degenerate. So indeed, if n goes to infinity, it will still be exactly degenerate. Now, is there, so the physics is obviously different, right? There must be a point where, where the system changes from having one ground state to having several ground states. And how can we understand this? And well, this, this is what, what Landau realized, that this is related to symmetries. So in some sense, it's a very, uh, very deep and certainly very influential discovery that symmetry is what kind of governs how systems behave. And so what's the point of the symmetry? Well, this Hamiltonian is invariant under flipping all the spins. So what we have is that H commutes with applying sigma x to all spins. I mean, it's easy to see the sigma x commutes with sigma x, right? And these guys anti-commute, but they always, always come in pairs, so they commute again. Also intuitively, right? This thing would like to align spins in parallel, but it doesn't care if they all point up or all down. So if you flip all spins, it's still the same interaction. And now the point is the following. So this ground state respects the symmetry, right? This one is different, right? If I have either this state here or this state here, all spins pointing up or all spins pointing down, these states don't respect the symmetry. They break the symmetry. So that's, that's the first insight. We can classify these different type of phases, this different type of behaviors by looking at the symmetry of our interactions and ask, does the ground state, or a randomly picked ground state, if you wish, does it respect the symmetry of the interactions, or does it break the symmetry of the interactions? If it breaks it, there must be a twin, because then I can act with a symmetry on it, I get a new ground state, but it will be a different one. So it's intimately related to the fact that there's a degeneracy that I break the symmetry. So by looking at how, how a ground state of a system behaves relative to the symmetries of the system, I can try to understand, to classify what the physics of the system is, how the physics behaves. And in particular, a very important property is that this allows me to measure something which is called an order parameter. Let me maybe very briefly say what that is. So what I will do is I want to measure the amount of symmetry breaking. So I will take an operator which doesn't commute with that one. So I will take something like sigma z at some position i, or say the average over all sigma z. Let me call this O. Now you can say if I, see if I measure the order parameter in this state here, It will have expectation value zero, right? Because this is a plus state. Um, right? If I take a state which points like that, I apply sigma z, I get a state which points in the opposite direction. So it will have overlap zero. In this case, it's different, right? Sigma z exactly measures how much of the spin is pointing up or down. So in this case, the order parameter will be plus one or minus one, depending on which state I have. So, so this way, what we have is that once we understand the symmetry, this tells us something about the ground space structure, but it also tells us how we can identify, how we can detect in which of these phases we are, right? So there is a way So phases, kind of conventional phases. Are characterized by how a system behaves relative to the symmetry, right? Of the Hamiltonian. And in particular, the, real que the question is, does a ground state break the symmetry. The second thing is that once we understand the symmetry, this also allows us to see how to identify in which phase we are. 
and how to label the different symmetry broken states. So then we can find an order parameter, which will first of all allows to de detect the state, sorry, detect, detect the phase, and also to distinguish or if you wish, label the symmetry broken states. So in some sense, what it tells me is that if I know that the average behavior of a single spin, I have a good understanding of what's going on overall. That's why we don't really have to look at the entanglement, because looking at the local property of a system, at the behavior of a single spin averaged over all spins, tells me the essential features of, of, of such a system. Okay, so what is quantum matter then? Well, quantum matter describes systems which cannot be described in this framework. So we can't understand the physics in this language. And this leads to a couple of interesting effects. I will just describe the effects so we kind of know what, where this is going. We'll see some example later on in one of the next lectures. Um, but quantum matter systems, well, they're also given by some Hamiltonian. We look at some ground state. And these ground states can exhibit different uh, properties. So for instance, for instance, we will have degenerate ground states which are locally indistinguishable, for which there exists no local order parameter. And by locally, I really mean it doesn't matter if you look at two sites, at 10 sites, at 100 sites, they will always look the same. You really will have to look at the global behavior of the system to be able to make any difference between the different ground states. So in particular, this means there's no local order parameter, right? If there would be any local difference, there would be a way to detect it, yes? Well, in that case, it's indeed zero. So the point is, is, is rather that in the ground state manifold, there are different states. Well, we have to be a bit careful. I mean, first of all, it means that in the ground state manifold, there are states which is zero or non-zero. If you pick a random state, it will always be non-zero. Now, if you ask what is physically reasonable, you will always find the states where this is maximal. I, I haven't talked about that. Um, but kind of the idea is if you have a state of that kind, This is what we usually call a cat state, right? It's like a big microscopic superposition. And it's very fragile to perturbations. Um, because you see, if you, if you put a very small magnetic field, say, on, the, on each spin, which points up, these states will get a vastly lower energy than these states immediately. So you will see that this two-fold two, two degenerate manifold and a very small perturbations, it will immediately go in one direction or the other. That's essentially the effect of symmetry breaking. But, but this is indeed exactly linked to the fact that there's a local order parameter which distinguishes them. Because if you would add a global perturbation which locally everywhere puts this field, but not with this normalization, you would get plus infinity here and minus infinity here. So you see that under fluctuations coming from the environment, these states are extremely susceptible to perturbations. So in nature, you indeed expect to find these where this is maximal. But, but on a mathematical level, it's actually a pretty subtle question, the symmetry breaking. And to, to the best of my understanding, it's not fully settled how the different notions of symmetry breaking and so on are related. Exactly, yeah. Indeed. Yeah, I didn't want to define it too thoroughly. I really more wanted to give the idea. But I agree. I mean, doing this properly is actually quite subtle. 
Okay, so these kind of systems will have different grounds that which look completely identical, which especially means there's no local order parameter. It also means that they're robust to noise, any kind of physical noise. Physical noise will also locally change parameters in the system in a fluctuating way. But if all these states are completely indistinguishable locally, it also means that any noise which couples locally will also not make any difference. Right? It's this, this uh, thing that if, if there's a way to read out information about the system, I will also perturb it. But if there's no way to perturb it in a specific way, I also cannot read out information. So it means that these systems are also robust to local noise. Which is why they could be useful, for instance, to store quantum information, because quantum information, well, should be protected from local noise. So one could, for instance, use it to build a quantum memory. So there are a number of more interesting features. So for instance, this ground state degeneracy will depend on if I, how I choose my boundary conditions for this Hamiltonian. So for instance, if I choose it with periodic boundary conditions or open boundary conditions, or maybe if I deform my lattice and put it on a sphere rather than on a torus, normal periodic boundary conditions, I will get different ground state degeneracies. So for instance, on a torus, the system would look different than on a sphere. On a torus, I might have a non, well, finite number of ground states, say four ground states, and here one ground state. Again, this is something which is completely inconsistent with this explanation. Because the way I can label the different ground states is exactly by the possible values this order parameter can take. So that's a local property, right? The possible values the order parameter can take doesn't care about the global geometry topology of my system. So again, this is completely inconsistent with this local description. Yes? Say again? Oh, yeah, they can shift. They can shift, indeed. Yes. Um, there are a number of more, more interesting properties relating the structure of excitations in these systems. We will get there. But this kind of hints that these kind of systems are really something which lies completely outside this conventional framework, which is basically a framework where, where we neglect the entanglement in the system to leading order and try to get a description of the physics just by looking at local properties, right, at the local order parameter. This is something which does not apply here. This is really outside of, of the Landau paradigm of local symmetry breaking. Conventional matter, if you wish. And the point is that quantum effects are really important, so this is why this is termed quantum matter then. Exactly. And kind of the idea is that, well, there is no local order parameter, but there is some kind of ordering in the sense that this degener de degeneracy means that some structure is emerging, right? If I keep all symmetries, there is no extra structure coming out of the system. I have a single state. If I have several states, there must be some way in which the system orders. And the idea is that one could think of this as some kind of ordering in the entanglement. And usually these kind of systems are also termed topological phases because global properties are relevant. It's a bit of a fuzzy, well, I think at least the etymology of topologic in that case is fuzzy, but it kind of makes sense in the sense that not only local properties, but the global topology of the system matters. And well, that's a, the kind of things we would like to look at in the following. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. Why is there an echo here? 
Okay, questions as of now? So just to remind you what we're looking at, we're looking at ground states. So as I said, I already mentioned this earlier, right? we're looking at the low temperature physics because we expect to see most of the quantum effects there. The second thing is if you look at the ground state of a system, the, typically it turns out the low-lying excited states can be kind of, or at least their essential features, can be derived from the ground state. So understanding the ground state also allows us to understand states above the ground state. The most quantum, and they contain features of the excited states. So what we're given is that we have some Hamiltonian on some kind of lattice system, which, well, in the simplest case, we might take as nearest neighbor or rapidly decaying. But maybe for simplicity, let's think about nearest neighbors. I mean, you know, if, if they're rapidly decaying, and you, you can always block a few sides, and they get even more local. So in essence, they're basically just between nearest neighbors. And what we need for this Hamiltonian is that it's, well, local, most importantly. And what we will typically also want is, it's not super important, but it's helpful that it's gapped. So what does it mean? Gapped means if we plot the eigenvalues, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, we will get a number of levels. And what we mean by gap basically is that between the lowest lying state and the next one, there is some gap delta. So this rules out states which have a degenerate ground state, but that's actually not so much what we care about. What we really want is that we want to know what happens when we make our system bigger and bigger. If we make our system bigger and bigger, we will get more and more eigenvalues of h because the dimension of the space grows exponentially. And this gap might change. So really, this depends on the system size if we take some uniform system. And what we really want is that the first excited state, regardless of how big the system is, stays at some distance from the ground state. So what we really want is that delta n is larger than some finite gamma for all n. So, so we don't want that as we make our system bigger, it gets easier and easier to take it away from the ground state because that means that a very big system, and we want to look at very big systems, will be unstable at any temperature or under any kind of perturbation. So we, we can't really expect them to show stable physics. So if we want stable physics, we want that it takes some finite amount of work, of energy, of effort to, to get the system out of its state. And that's why we want a gap to the excited state. No, that's not so important. It's more a technical condition, which we show up later, so I thought I stated. Well, any, it could be anything, right? If it's spin one half, I guess you can write on the Pauli basis, indeed. But uh, it could be anything, right? It's, uh, we, we don't want to assume much. I mean, what we want to assume that the way the systems interact is, is, is in some local way, right? So distant particles interact very weakly, and maybe we can neglect it. Um, but this could also be a higher level system, right? This could be a 10 level system in principle, which could have a more complex interaction. I guess, you know, in practice, there will be some symmetries in the interactions from the way you build it, or you might even want it to build it in a symmetric way. But uh, we, we will not require that in the first place. It, I mean, for many results, it can also be algebraic if it's fast enough. 
which is, I think, typically something like dimension plus one or so. You could say Coulomb is a bit critical, but usually Coulomb is shielded, so on any effective level, the Coulomb interaction will decay much faster. You, you will not have a one over R decay, right? But probably more like a dipole dipole interaction type decay or so. Sorry? It should be short range in some sense, exactly. Okay, so maybe the last 10 minutes, let me actually would be make a nice point to conclude. Okay, so, so starting from these things and what I said, uh, what we would like to know is what makes these kind of, okay, so maybe what is called the area law. And so the, 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 the problem we're facing is kind of the following. On the one hand, we want to describe um, we want to describe quantum matter, so we know that the matter we describe is not described by a simple product state ansatz, by neglecting the entanglement. So we know we need to include the entanglement. Now the problem is if we include the entanglement, we have this, well, I just erased it, this exponentially big Hilbert space, right? So we have a Hilbert space which is C D tensor N. So it's D to the N dimensional. So we have this huge Hilbert space, and in this huge Hilbert space, we need to describe a system, and that's completely hopeless, right? We, we, we just can't specify so many parameters for sufficiently large N. Right? If you have a computer, even if D is two, you can maybe go to N equal 25 or 30 or something like that. And that's when, when basically uh, there's no way to go further. Now, on the other hand, what we also know is that our system is described by this Hamiltonian here, right? So if we ac actually ask how many parameters describe the ground state, one answer is well, the Hamiltonian describes the ground state. And the Hamiltonian doesn't have many parameters, right? So how many parameters does it have? Well, worst case, if anything can interact with anything, we have two-body interactions, n squared, right? But typically, if it's local, we will say it has order of n terms. But even if it's n squared or it's three-body n cubed, it still scales much, much, much better in n than something like two to the n. So what we kind of see is that we would expect that the Silbert space should have a very small region, which we could call the physical corner, And that's the kind of state we would like to be able to describe. Now, it's a bit misleading to draw this picture, right? Because um, it's not a convex set or anything. But uh, the idea is that it's a very small subset of this very big Hilbert space, which is what we're actually interested in, if we want to describe ground states or even low energy states of a system, just by parameter counting, we know that, right? The problem, of course, is we could just specify immediately the Hamiltonian. But the Hamiltonian, it's very hard to extract information out of it. So we want a more succinct way to actually describe the wave function of the system. Maybe that's also a bit of a quantum information approach to look more at wave functions and at interactions. So if we want to describe this kind of physical corner, we need a more, more succinct, a more explicit way of figuring out what makes these states special, these ground states or low-lying states of a system with local interactions. And while it turns indeed out that they're very special regarding their entanglement properties, And this is exactly what the area law tells us. So, so what is the question we're asking? Well, I guess you already all heard some, some things about entanglement, right? So if you want to look at an entanglement, at the entanglement in a system, we have a system consisting of two parts, A and B. And they're in a joint state, psi AB. If I want to compute the entanglement between A and B, I have to trace out the B system, look only at the reduced state of the A system. And then I have to compute the von Neumann entropy. Maybe Barbara will say more about that. Um, so she goes from first half. Sorry? Only the beginning, 
actually, but well, at least. Okay, so if we compute this entropy here, this will be exactly a measure of the entanglement between the part A and the part B. So we can try to do this for a quantum many body system. So let's take some quantum many body system and ask exactly that, how much entanglement is there in such a system? So let's take some of these, one of these lattice systems. And we cut some region out of it. And this region we call A, and the rest of the system we call B. So this region, say, has a size L by L. And now, well, the total system is in some pure state Psi AB. Just the total ground state of our system, right, which lives in this huge space in principle. So now we can compute the reduced state of A, rho A. And we can ask, what is S of rho A? So now, now one thing people have looked at in quantum information is if I take a typical a random state, so a random state in this exponentially big space, what is S of rho A? So for a typical, so to say, random state, it turns out that, well, what I assume is that the total system is very big, right? So L is much smaller than the system size. I'm looking at a relatively small part of a big system. Then it will turn out that S of rho A is basically as big as a volume of the system. So it's some constant, which I guess is log D times L squared, which is a volume, really, of the whole thing, minus some subleading correction. I'm not sure how it scales, presumably log L or so. But it's something which goes to zero very quickly, basically. It's, 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 it's something which, which disappears. Um, so, so basically, what this tells us is that pretty much all degrees of freedom in, in, in that region A are entangled with all degrees of freedom outside. All degrees of freedom So it's a huge mess, right? The entanglement is completely spread out. So that's, that certainly seems like a very messy situation. But we are, of course, interested not in typical states, but in very special states, which live in this very small corner, which are ground states of some local interaction. And there actually something remarkable happens if we look at these systems, if we study such systems. What one finds is that this only goes like some constant alpha times the length of the boundary of the system. Plus some subleading terms. So the leading term here only scales like the boundary of that region and not like the volume of the region. And the same we would see in 1D, or actually in any dimension. So like in 1D, for instance, it would be a constant plus something which goes to zero as our system gets bigger. So, but in both cases, the point is that the entanglement really only scales like the boundary of the system, not like the volume. And this is what is called the area law. Uh, I suspect because it comes from... Uh, the gravity community, where you're actually in three-dimensional space most of the time. That's, that's my impression. I agree it's confusing, because indeed in the picture I draw the area as a volume. So it's really the surface area of a bulk. But I, my impression is that it really comes from, from black hole and holographic principle, where you actually have three dimensions in space. Um, exactly. So area law, which states that the entanglement in ground states
of gapped systems. Scales like the boundary. Rather than the volume. Now this is something which has been proven for one dimensional systems rigorously by Hastings. And there is some improved version by Vizik, Vadirani, Vazirani, Landau, I think Kitai is also on some of these papers, where people get, get better bounds in terms of the gap. How does a gap relate to this constant here? So in 1D, we have proofs of that. In 2D, I don't think we know of any proper counterexample to that. Um, so in 2D, it also seems to hold. So it, it's generally believed, like in all systems, one looks at to be a general statement. And well, what does it tell us? It kind of tells us that kind of the message is that the entanglement is only sitting at the boundary between regions. So in some sense, it says that the entanglement is local, right? The structure of the entanglement in the system, despite the fact that there is a lot of entanglement, the entanglement is local. And well, starting from this point that the entanglement in quantum many body systems in their ground states should be local, should be distributed in a local fashion, I will start constructing some kind of ansatz, some kind of approach to describe these wave functions in the next lecture. Um, any questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. and the, the spectrum to be gapped, mm -hmm. all these elements are needed. Just local doesn't In 2D, I'm not sure we have any counterexample. I mean, in, in 2D, we know that critical systems have an additive log correction. Well, in 1D, we also know they have an additive log correction, if you wish, but, so, okay. So the point is that for, for a gapless system in 1D, the entropy scale is like log L for a region of length L, which is a violation of the constant area law. In 2D, what we have is that it scales like L plus log L, which is not in violation of an upper bound which scales like a constant times L. So it might be that in 2D, even for gapless systems, it, it holds in general. Now, now, I guess from a proof point of view, the question is what is the upper bound? From an intuition point of view, I think what people actually want to know is how does it scale? And I'm not sure that condensed matter physicists would call it an area law if it's L plus log L in 2D they might actually say that there's a logarithmic correction. They would only call it area law if the subleading term is one over L or something which doesn't go with L. That's, that's my feeling, but uh, otherwise, yeah, in 2D it might work without gap. Are there more questions? Uh, um, log behavior comes from, mm, in, in 1D, you can see it from renormalization. If you kind of say at every length scale, the system behaves, if you have a critical system, right? It's scale invariant in 1D. You say at every length scale, it behaves the same. And then you say, how much entanglement does this give? You have a fixed amount of entanglement. The next level, you have half the entanglement. And the next, you again have half the entanglement. And then you see you get a logarithmic divergence. You get 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth and so on. Well, well uh, the, the area law, uh, well, well the, the, the proof works for, it's about quantum Hamiltonians, right? It's about entanglement. Um, but I mean, I mean, the proof works for any one dimensional Hamiltonian, like Hamilton acting on a 1D chain, which has a lower bound on the spectral gap as the system gets bigger. I mean, it's all about scaling behavior, these things. Say again? Well, for 2D, we don't have a proof, but we still see it. So, so that's a point. Um, this is a general law in the sense of that's, that's what you see when you look at systems, um, but it's only proven in 1D. So in 1D, it's proven for gap systems, and we know it doesn't work for gapless systems. I mean, just three fermions um, in, in, in 1D will, will have a log correction uh, from the Fermi surface, basically. Okay, I should say that in 2D, actually, fermions also have a log correction, a multiplicative log correction. So for fermionic systems, also in 2D, it doesn't hold. For spin systems, I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, 
I'm around. Go to the left. The other one is free, so you all students interested go to Professor Nelly and then they meet you there. Sure. Talk to me. Let us thank.